Ugh. Dumb monsters. Didn't get it. Whoops. There's something on every screen that can kill you in that game. The hero of Quest for Glory starts the game weak and inexperienced. Normally, players build up their character stats through many hours of gameplay. But for the past decade, a select group of speedrunners have analyzed every movement, scrutinized every action, and brought the time down to a level that no one could have imagined. Join me for the history of Quest for Glory 1 Any% Percent Speedruns. By the end of the 1980s, Sierra Online had firmly established itself as a leader in adventure gaming, and they were always on the lookout for new markets. Ken Williams, co-founder and CEO of the company, saw the sales potential in role-playing games. He enlisted Lori and Corey Cole to develop an RPG adventure hybrid that would eventually be released as Heroes Quest in 1989. Players choose between three classes, fighter, magic user, or thief. You can also play a hybrid class, like giving a fighter magical abilities. This allows for nearly limitless possibilities in how to play the game and defeat the evils of Spielberg Valley. There's an evil ogress that has cast a curse over the land. Now it causes all sorts of things. The, the baron of the land, his son disappears, his daughter disappears, suddenly brigands move into the uh, the valley. There's There's just problems everywhere. And you come in as a fresh hero off of the famous adventurer's correspondence school, <laughs> FACS, just ready to make a name for yourself as a hero and solve all the problems of the kingdom. So your main quest is to just deal with the leader. Now, uh, spoiler alert, it turns out the leader is the Baron's missing daughter, Elsa. And so uh, she's got an enchantment on her and she's impossible to beat in combat. So you need to get a dispel potion and uh, get rid of the enchantment on her. Your hero is practically zero. They're at their very beginning of their career. They're so weak that simple forest goblins are a major threat. Quest for Glory 1 is without a doubt the most lethal game in the series. The game turned out to be a surprise bestseller for Sierra, moving more copies than anyone anticipated. The game also caught the attention of Milton Bradley, who owned the trademark rights to Hero Quest, a board game. After a cease and desist, Sierra would change the name to Quest for Glory in future printings. Let's move forward now to a time when a few brave souls entered town, signed their name in the logbook, and started speedrunning. Today, we'll be focusing on the Any% percent category. Finish the game as quickly as possible, using any method possible. To finish Quest for Glory, players need the ingredients for a Dispel Potion, a Magic Acorn, Flying Water, green fur, flowers from Arana's Peace, and fairy dust. They then need to enter the Brigand's Fortress. You can fight your way through the front if your stats are high enough. But it would take a lot of time to get your character to that point. Fortunately, you can also use a secret passageway to get in, find the Brigand Leader, and use the Dispel Potion on her. Optionally, you can take a mirror from this desk and use it on Baba Yaga, the Ogress, to ensure her evil leaves the valley for good. But if you exit without taking it, the game ends at that point, although with a less desirable outcome. The first recorded run comes from Reynault in 2007. Renault begins with buying the open spell from Zara's shop, then runs to Arana's Peace, a magical meadow, to grab the flowers. He also casts Open to find a scroll with the Calm spell. Then it's off to a cave to free what seems like a bear, but is actually the Baron's son. Reynault then grabs some water and heads to the castle stables to make the in-game timer advance. Reynault also spends a fair bit of time increasing his climbing skill at this tree. Skills in Quest for Glory increase by doing actions repeatedly, and Reynault shimmies up and down for about three minutes. Why? Because there's a seed he needs on this screen. There are a number of ways to get it, and Renault chooses to climb up a ledge and catch it. From there, Renault collects the green fur, the fairy dust, and the magic acorn. Now we have all the ingredients to make our dispel potion. After that, it's off to the secret passageway guarded by a troll named Fred, who will normally clobber the heck out of you, but he'll leave you alone if you know the secret password. 
This leads to Toro, a Minotaur with lots of damage and HP. This is normally a really tough fight. Reynault, on the other hand, with his magic, casts Calm on Toro, then casts Open on the gate. He has to avoid a few traps, drop a chandelier on some Three Stooges lookalikes, and make it through a magical maze created by Yorick, previous court jester and ally to Elsa. Renault asks about Elsa, which lets Yorick know that you're a friend. This makes him jump out of the room, which is great because then you don't have to worry about him throwing things at you and slowing you down. At long last, we've reached Elsa. The Dispel Potion forces her to remember herself, and Reynault exits the room, having finished the game in 9 minutes and 29 seconds. While not a perfect run, this was the blueprint for amazing things to come. Well, that was ground zero for pretty much everything. The thought that one of those Quest for Glory games could be done in under 10 minutes was mind-blowing. Absolutely mind-blowing at the time. My name is uh, Paul Miller. Uh, I go by the handle Mr. PR Miller. Professionally, I've done a little bit of everything, but right now I'm a uh, minister in the United Methodist Church and I speed run the Quest for Glory games. And it's pretty much the only game I run. All of them. They're just, ah, love them. Love them to death. <laughs> Paul would first speed run the VGA version of the first game, with routing help from fellow runners Renault, Crow, and Purry Purry. This was an official remake released in 1992 that updated the game's graphics and added a point-and-click interface. Eventually, he would get a run accepted to Speed Demo's archive. The Speed Demo's archive for me was like the, the pinnacle, and I always wanted to have a run on there. To see that I had my first approved run on there, th that was cool. Soon after, he turned his attention to the original EGA version. In late 2015, he would begin what would become a long journey of breaking the game wide open. The name change of Hero's Quest to Quest for Glory wasn't the only difference since the initial release. Version 1.102 introduced several bug fixes and code changes, and those, along with the Quest for Glory moniker, make up version 1.2. 1.2 is what you'll get if you buy the game commercially today, and is what Renault was using but version 1.0 has some unique features that make an enormous difference in the speedrun. The biggest things are Fred's Cave, and Fred's Cave is only accessible through a password that you're meant to learn after you free the bear in a Cobalt's Cave. It triggers a dialogue scene between a thief of the area named Bruno and one of the brigands who's causing trouble in the valley and that you overhear the password in order to get Fred, who's a troll, to go into a, um, a back room. 1.2 requires that you hear that password. 1.0 allows you to metagame it, and you could just type it in, and you can go right into the cave. Uh, they don't require you to have learned it anywhere before. As long as you knew what the password was, you were set and you were good to go. On October 12th, 2015, Mr. P.R. Miller would complete this run, using the thief. Renault had put most of his points into stealth so that he could steal a key and free the bear. But in version 1.0, this was no longer necessary. Paul puts most of his initial points into climbing, so he doesn't need to develop it during the run, like Renault. In the beginning of the run, Miller gets himself thrown out of the tavern multiple times, which helps to advance the in-game time more efficiently. He moves into this alley and climbs over the wall, saving some time, and then gathers the Dispel Potion items. With the potion in hand, he runs straight for the passageway and gives the password, having never properly learned it. Paul finishes the run with a 631, a nearly three minute improvement. A few days later, he would use the fighter, throwing a rock at the seed instead of climbing. His movement here is more refined and confident, and he would take the any percent record down to 535, and then to 532 on October 16th. The time was steadily creeping downwards, but fate would have it that slow progress wasn't good enough, and Paul Miller would soon discover something that, in his words, pretty much destroys the game. I was a full-time seminary student, so I was going through master's classes, and in my downtime, I would 
run Quest for Glory. I was running the VGA version. My son was sitting on my lap while I'm on the computer and I'm running back and forth and I make it to the last room and he decides to shift at that moment and it bumps my arm just a little bit out of the way. And instead of grabbing the dispel potion, which was what I was aiming for, it made me grab a dagger. And just going off of instinct, not realizing exactly what had happened, I clicked OK and I missed clicked because I didn't quite click on her. My character threw the dagger instead and I went, I can move. Normally your feet are glued to the ground whenever you uh, whenever you're in there and suddenly I can move. So I ran out the door and said, I wonder what will happen. Well, what ended the game? I call it the Wesley glitch affectionately because it's named after my second son. It was the first major skip that was discovered in Quest for Glory. It wouldn't be until late October that Paul got around to trying it in Hero's Quest. And as he found out, it worked in that game too. Runners didn't need the Dispel Potion anymore, nor did they have to gather any of the ingredients. With this amazing glitch, Miller earned a 217 on October 23rd, cutting the game's time in half. The next month, he would take the record down even further, to 2 minutes and 10 seconds. The Wesley glitch had turned the entire run upside down. But there was another useful technique that Mr. P.R. Miller opted not to use. The other major difference between 1.0 and 1.2 is something that's called High Speed Hero. For older systems to be able to run it, it would skip some frames of animation, so that way the hero would zip across the screen faster and older systems could run it. I mean, who knew what an old EGA, I mean, you need to have a blazing fast computer to handle all 16 colors and whatnot. Paul decided not to use High Speed Hero, as it made your character difficult to control and required turning it on and off throughout the run because you actually can't use it on every screen. In fact, you can't even transition to some doors on some screens. You also can't get through Fred's cave. It makes the, you can't get into Fred's cave. It can't be turned on at all in the cafeteria. You also can't go through some of the doors in Yorick's room and you can't get out of the last room. In fact, it's not very useful for many transitions now that I think about it. So, the record of two minutes and 10 seconds stood, just waiting for someone to break it. In 2016, Paul had been accepted to run the Quest for Glory collection at RPG Limit Break, a speedrunning marathon for RPGs. The collection is a full series run, playing through all five games as quickly as possible. This alone would have put a lot of pressure on anyone but Miller faced several additional challenges. It was actually the first time I'd ever streamed ever. Like, I mean, never at home, never at, that was ground zero for me to ever be on camera on a live stream. He also managed to bring on some very special guests. Hi, this is Corey Cole. I'm uh, the uh, co-designer of the uh, Quest for Glory series. And I was the lead programmer for the first uh, two games. And we have with us. Lori Cole. I was designer for the games and writer for the games and kind of co-director for a lot of these games. That was a fanboy moment for me because, I mean, I've been playing these games for years now and I never thought I'd ever actually interrupt, let alone break in half the game in front of them. There was something that Lori said during the runs that I said, I'm kind of sorry, I'm, you know, I'm not exactly playing the game you intended it to play. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. We intended this game to be fun. And yep. That means however the player wants to play it. Okay. All right. Now I know my answer for whenever somebody says I played it wrong. <laughs> In December of 2016, a Sierra enthusiast by the name of C-Square contacted Paul Miller and asked to collaborate on a tool-assisted speedrun of the game. Working together, the two would share several discoveries that would not only optimize the tasks, but fundamentally change real-time speedruns as well. One of the key insights had to do with the slow keyboard entry. The game only pulls the keyboard once every seven frames, or about a tenth of a second. In other words, every key press takes a tenth of a second to register. Finding the most efficient text inputs was now imperative. Some examples include typing open instead of open door, or toss knife instead of throw dagger. But a bigger time save was finding out that it was not necessary to use Calm to get past Toro. Normally, if you rush out on this screen, Toro sees you and the battle begins. But by running out, 
and hitting the bush, Toro will hear the bush, but not see you. If you then cast open on the door to unlock it, you can walk over, open the door, and head on in. The way it seems to work is, is that you get Toro to notice that something rustled in the bushes, but he can't see you. It seems as if that puts the game's engine on a timer for when he'll notice you again. And if you are far enough away from him, he won't notice you for a couple seconds until he's on his return cycle on the way back. The previous route required runners to go many screens north to Arana's Peace and grab the Calm Scroll, which is how you learn the spell. But this new trick meant the detour north could be skipped altogether. That completely skips having to head north. You can go right to the end of the brigands, and that route is actually still the route that exists today. Just before C-Square officially released the TAS, Paul would achieve this run. He doesn't use the bush rustling strat, since the movement required is extremely precise and not practical for a real-time run. Instead, Paul plays as a thief and uses sneak to get past Toro, which requires extra text input, but is still faster than grabbing the calm spell. The record was now 1 minute and 49 seconds. A week later, the task would come out with a blazing fast time of 42 seconds. The next few years wouldn't see much activity for world records. Paul's focus was always on the collection runs, and at the time, using the VGA version was faster than the EGA. The EGA credits are a lot longer than the remake, and you have to wait out this sequence in order to save your character and import it into the next game. So, for the time being, most of his activity would be in the VGA version. In 2018, a new task would be released, incorporating two new strategies suggested by the player and task creator, Fractal Fusion. First, instead of pressing enter after typing a command, players can click on the input bar. This is helpful because mouse clicks register faster than keystrokes. While not entirely useful for human players, this was trivial to implement in a task. Second, as is common with other Sierra text parsers, it's possible to stack nouns. The parser only looks at the first and last word entered, so you can type push chair, then F3 to repeat that text, then type candle at the end, which the game will interpret as push candle. Finally, it was discovered that instead of pushing the rock at the entrance to the hidden passageway, you can get the rock, and it does the same thing. I suppose the game just wants you to interact with the rock one way or another. Overall, this saved 1.8 seconds over the previous task, right up until the last screen where 0.8 seconds were stolen away. It seems that Elsa can only jump over her desk once every second. So if you can't save enough time to get to the next second barrier, it doesn't matter. This is commonly known as a frame rule. This was brutal for the task, but was also something that would affect real-time runs, especially as the time became more and more optimized. Later in 2018, another incredibly talented runner would use those optimizations to ascend the speedrunning ranks. My name is David TKI, uh, father of two kids, got a software engineering day job, and I spent some time speedrunning. Like Paul, David would initially focus on the VGA version, because that's what was used in collection runs. But then, in late 2018, David and Paul were accepted to the speedrun marathon Questing for Glory. This was to be an any percent collection race between the two, and they had the idea for each of them to play a different version of the first game just to make it interesting. Practicing for the marathon meant lots of runs in EGA for David. On October 29th, he would earn this run, using a variation of the Bush strategy discovered in the 2016 TAS. The task moves forward slightly to trigger the bushes, but this is very precise and dangerous to do as a human. However, if you're running and press down right diagonal, your hero will hit the bush and then bounce off of it. This is perfectly safe and easy to do consistently. However, you still have to time your exit correctly. Too soon or too late, and Toro will spot you. In Elsa's room, David saved a few keystrokes by using a strategy discovered by C-Square. 
Instead of throwing the dagger, it's possible to cast open and achieve the same game-breaking effect. This is useful as pressing Control c enters the word cast automatically. David would earn a 133, more than 10 seconds faster than Miller's previous world record. By the time the marathon rolled around, David had improved the run to the point where runners switched to using the EGA version in collection runs. We thought that VGA was faster because its ending is a lot shorter. It's about a minute and a half for the remake versus three minutes for the original game. When I was practicing for Questing for Glory 2, I uh, ended up improving the execution of the any percent run to the point where we figured out, no, actually EGA is faster. David would steadily drop the record over the next few months. A 129 in late January, followed by a 127. Paul was doing collection runs at this time as well, and on January 26th, 2019, he would earn a 125, putting him back at the top of the ranks. But his championship place would not last long. David was not only becoming more proficient, but also innovating the use of High Speed Hero. Paul Miller had thought it was too difficult to use, but as we've seen, speedrunners are made to push boundaries. High Speed Hero is kind of a double-edged sword, because your hero moves so much more quickly when you have it on, but at the same time, you lose accuracy when you're using it. You basically need to be able to turn it on when you need the speed, and then turn it off when you need the accuracy. You have to spend a lot of time practicing it before you can really use it. David would get a 123, and then a 121. In May of 2019, David would run the Quest for Glory collection at RPG Limit Break, this time dressing in costume as the hero. It was kind of cheaply assembled from whatever I could buy off Amazon at the time, but like I had always liked the idea of dressing up as the hero. David had practiced so much for the marathon that he was in perfect form to continue bringing the time down. On May 12th, he uses a slightly different strategy in Yorick's room. Yorick will sometimes just cast random spells at you and they might hit you in the head and slow you down a little bit. And the safest thing to do is just ask him about Elsa and that lets him know you're a friend and then he'll leave the room and you can just do the room normally. But it takes time to make him leave the room. Eventually, at a certain level of optimization, you just have to go through the room and chance that he's not going to throw anything at you. Having successfully navigated the room, David earned a 116. And that's where the record stood, for over a year. In September of 2020, David was running the 100% Magic user category, looking for a sub-18. He was getting frustrated at the grind, so he went back to any percent to, in his words, take a little heat off. And on September 2nd, he earned a 113. In the same month, Paul would find yet another skip, this time for Yorick's room. You need high speed hero on. You come right down to about here. You try to follow this line down and click right about there. And then, ready? You have to be running also, so ready? Oh, you gotta hit F4 the moment this thing goes away. No stop, no door. Unfortunately, the amount of effort it would take to execute this during a run meant it wasn't worth the risk, and the idea was set aside. So, Miller had no choice but to simply start grinding runs again. He quickly caught up to David, earning a 111 on September 15th, 2020. He would use cast at Yorick to make him leave. It turns out you don't even need to cast anything, so this used fewer keystrokes. Paul would also, finally, start using High Speed Hero. The first time I saw it used in RTA was David TKI. He was kind of the guy who pioneered toggling it on and off. And once I saw him doing it, I mean, there were, it was just a matter of incorporating it in places where I knew I couldn't screw it up, like the forest transitions. The next few months were all about execution and grinding the time down one second at a time. Oh, that was really bad luck. Here we go. Three, two, one, go. Good time. This could be a good, really good time. That's a new record. <laughs>
Paul Miller would go on to earn a 109 on October 1st, and then this run on January 5th. I know where I'm at. Yes! Yes! <laughs> Shortly thereafter, we would see a new task from David. This used two new typing optimizations, use chair candle instead of move chair candle, and hop instead of climb. This only saved three keystrokes, but the previous tasks had entered in a name for the hero at the beginning because those key presses weren't enough to save the next frame rule. This matters because, according to task video's rules, time begins at power on. Combining the new text optimizations with not entering a name was just enough to make Elsa's frame rule and save an extra second over the old tasks. January would also see Paul use a new strategy in the first room of the Brigand Fortress. Walking across these nearly invisible tripwires normally means a game over. It's possible to walk up to them and jump or hop over them, but that takes time. During the tool-assisted run, uh, C-Square discovered that if you move diagonally over the tripwires, they don't trigger the death scenes, so you won't trip over the tripwire if you're moving diagonally, which is real easy for a tool-assisted run to manipulate. Moving diagonally across the tripwires was a bit trickier for human players, and it was faster to just go around everything. What I found and what I discovered is that if you have high-speed hero on, you can actually head directly to the right and up. You skip the rope. Since High Speed Hero increases your pixel movement rate, Paul was able to move through the room, keeping High Speed Hero on the entire time. Paul would continue his collection attempts, which meant more and more Quest for Glory 1, and the potential for more world records. But with the game already so optimized, each screen was now a potential run killer. Because I'm using High Speed Hero to head south in the forest, I'm always in danger of the mouse not registering my clicks fast enough, which means instead of heading to the left, I head south and I hit what I affectionately call Lake Stupid. Others have called it Lake Miller. I, I like to think they're synonymous. Getting into the Antwerp door is surprisingly tricky because you have to be in a precise location in order to cast open. You have to actually type cast open. And Mr. Pure Miller has mistyped that very often. And then you have to be in the right place to do hide and go see. And all that has to go off without a hitch or else you get stuck on the door and then have to reset. And then there's Yorick. Yorick is always going to hit you in the face with a boot or something like that if you're unlucky going through. And you're never safe. It's every single screen. There's something that can kill you. I mean, even if you minimize the risk of the rest, you might not be able to make it through that little sliver of like two or three pixels to exit Elsa's room. So if you misclick there, you, you just lost a full second. And of course, there's Elsa's frame rule. If Paul didn't get to Elsa's room in time, a new world record would remain out of reach. And so, Paul forged ahead, run after run. This is on pace. Oh boy. I got it! I got it! I got it! Oh, I got it! I know that was 107! Can somebody clip that? Can somebody clip that? <laughs> oh, here we go again. Yeah! <gasps> oh, gosh. That's it. 105. <laughs> In February of 2021, with the record sitting at an incredible 105, Paul would then attempt the unthinkable, a blindfolded run. It took nearly 30 minutes, but Quest for Glory had now been beaten without looking at the screen. So what more was there to do? Paul Miller, the best Quest for Glory one-runner of all time, didn't think he would be able to pull off a 104. 
at least not immediately. Would he be able to overcome the precise movements, the demanding keyboard inputs, and most importantly, his own self-doubt? Four. And there it happened, friends. <laughs> Return of the Oipen. Oh. Oh, we're going to have that kind. Oh. I feel like I'm on point tonight, too. Like, I, I could go 103 if everything goes right, so. Uh-oh. Got it. 103! <laughs> 103! 104 and 103 had been enough of a hurdle. Paul was now at a point where he was using High Speed Hero on the very first screen to save time. At the very beginning of my current runs, I turn on High Speed Hero as the screen's transitioning off of the character select screen, and I run to the left, and while I'm running to the left and the screen's transitioning, I turn off High Speed Hero again using a hotkey, go into the door for the magic shop, because you can't go into the door at the magic shop if High Speed Hero's on. And while that transition is happening, I turn it back on again. Even with that optimization, making the next frame rule and breaking the next second barrier would be a formidable task. But then, another piece of the puzzle fell into place. In March, user Andante49 found that Rob stops the roll in Yorick's room, which would save one keystroke. On further investigation, Cara Valencia discovered that you could also type N, Apparently, this is short for no. This was a time save of about a third of a second. Paul had the skill, and now he had all the tools to get a 102. He just needed to make it happen. Didn't get it. Lake Stupid, all right. Lake Miller. Whew. figures. Ah. Oh. That may have been if all things went right and I didn't screw up that last movement. That may have been a 101. <sighs> now I know it's there. Now I, I, I want it more because I know I was on pace to get it. Paul Miller hadn't gotten a 102. He had done the unthinkable, the seemingly impossible. He skipped 102 and went straight to 101. 103 to 101, and I was like, how the heck did I skip a second frame roll? It had to have been the frame roll. It's the only explanation for what happened there. Um, just really <laughs> blew my mind. Over the next few months, Paul Miller would do more collection runs and eventually get a number of 102s. But it looked like 101 was the limit. How could the record possibly get any lower? 
On June 21st, David made a discovery while working on a task for the 100% category of the game. The parser will take the word it in place of the last noun. Because you buy open at Zara's shop, you could cast it at the entrance to Fred's cave instead of typing cast open. On May 29th, I was learning the run and on the last screen, I was flailing around for the exit. By chance, I clicked on the chest. As it turns out, this, followed by the right arrow, is an easy, consistent setup for leaving the room cleanly. Good paced runs were now more likely to finish. But this, on its own, wouldn't drop the world record any lower. On July 3rd, runner Dark Armist was learning the game. Dark Armist is an accomplished VGA runner and used to the mouse for movement, so that's what he was using for the majority of the run, including in Fred's cave. This got Paul thinking. He had tried High Speed Hero here and given up on the idea. But what if he could make it work? With the run so optimized, it was worth trying. If he could find a consistent spot to click in the cave and then click on the bush instead of using the keyboard, he wouldn't have to turn off High Speed Hero at all. He would be fighting years of muscle memory. Oh, I turned off High Speed. I gotta just leave High Speed Hero on because I'm so used to hitting F4 there. So I turned it off instead of on. <laughs> but if he could get it down, a one minute time seemed within reach. Oh, man, there is like no forgiveness. Oh, oh, even with the bonk. Come on. Oh, I did it. I got a 101 again. <laughs> oh, that should have been fine. Oh, I'm getting faster at that Fred cave. It's a good run. That... <sighs> as of the time of this video, one minute stands as the current world record. The obvious question? Can it go any lower? I, I hate to speculate where the fastest times could be, but I think if everything went right, 57 might be possible. Might be possible, I don't know. Somebody could find something new and completely blow our minds. It frightens me <laughs> think about. <laughs> Speedrunners are always pushing boundaries, digging deeper, and channeling their inner heroes. There are many other Quest for Glory titles and numerous categories, but for now, this is where our tale ends. 
I want to give a big thank you to my patrons, and if you're interested in supporting the channel, take a moment and check out my Patreon page where I post behind the scenes videos and director's commentary. Until next time, keep your eyes peeled for brigands, don't drink the dragon's breath, and I'll see you in the next one. Can you give me a dad joke before we sign off here? Why was the scarecrow promoted? He was outstanding in his field. <laughs>